This week, the major wildfires tearing through the West Coast broke records as hundreds of thousands of people flee their homes. Plus, stocks hit a roadblock, but the year of the retail trader shows no signs of slowing down. And finally, the latest proposal for more coronavirus relief funds was squashed in the Senate, as millions around the country remain unemployed. I'm Mackenzie Segalos, and this is CNBC After Hours. Before we get started, we want to take a moment and acknowledge the 19th anniversary of the September 11th attacks in 2001, when nearly 3,000 people lost their lives. Wall Street paid their respects as well, observing moments of silence on the trading floors of both the New York Stock Exchange and the NASDAQ earlier this morning. All right, now let's look at how the stock market finished the week. All three major indices are lower, with the NASDAQ posting the biggest loss more than 4%. This short trading week was the worst for the index since March, as the big tech stocks that were so hot all spring and summer are now cooling off. Another big market trend this spring and summer, retail traders. Now, when we say retail traders, what we mean are individual people like you or your parents, the investors who aren't the pros or the billionaire family offices or massive institutional pension plans. Well, the little guys are trading big time in 2020, and one retail brokerage is beating out all the competition tenfold. CNBC's Kate Rooney dug into those numbers. Retail traders have been logging on to check their portfolios at record levels. JMP Securities looked at web traffic and mobile app downloads at online brokers. That was through the end of August. Website visits continued to climb in recent months, outpacing levels even prior to the pandemic. Usually market interest coincides with volatility, but web traffic stayed strong even as that March madness for stocks calmed down. Analysts say it indicates a bit more interest in people with their financial lives. They're likely logging on to check their portfolio and using some of those tools for education. JMP also looked at mobile app downloads, which they say tend to give more of a flavor for new account openings. Robinhood is crushing the competition in that category. Ameritrade and E-Trade only have about 30% of their users on mobile, while Robinhood is majority mobile. Still, when adjusting for that difference, JMP estimates that Robinhood's app downloads are 10 times higher than the other online brokers. This online activity could bode pretty well for the industry. More engagement tends to result in more account growth and ability to cross-sell products. And now let's get to our sound check. Here's a timeline of This Week in Business told in just a few sound bites. In addition to all the technology that we're bringing in the value from both an Ultium and a Hydrotech technology perspective, there also then is, uh, we'll be doing the manufacturing and validation and engineering. So all of that comes together. And again, it's for the Badger, but it's also for the fuel, sec fuel cell technology for the Nikolai uh, products in the uh, class seven and eight truck business. So this is a huge growth opportunity for us. GM is a perfect partner to be able to build the Badger. The truck's coming out. Um, Nikola's building out hydrogen networks. I mean, we just couldn't be more happy with this partnership. It's, it, that's why people are rewarding us. It's, it's a long-term play. It's the ability to get in early. And that's what Nikola is. It's a, it's a great relationship with GM. Inevitably, after a big party, there's a hangover. And right now, we're in a, an absolute raging mania. I just want to remind people <laughs> that um, there is no valuation support because we dropped 10%. That hasn't mattered um, because we're so far outside of the valuation realm with the Fed doing what they're doing, that doesn't matter. But I would say that the next three to five years are gonna be very, very challenging. Most companies have a hard time executing on something as radical as, you know, let's go direct to consumer over the internet. Um, and they've done a remarkable job growing to over 60 million in less than 12 months, you know, and it took us like 12 or 13 years to get there. Um, so uh, they're, you know, very focused, obviously, on uh, direct to consumer, um, but so are we. And I think, uh, you know, we love the challenge and we want to bring the challenge to them. We want to get better than Disney in family entertainment. And that's going to take five or 10 years. You know, they are very, very good at it. Hey, 
pledges are very important, but you know, we uh, we as African American community, we also want to see people, you know, do things too, because it's not about the money. It's about you know coming in, you know, giving people equal opportunity, treating people fairly. Every time we have a woman break in, we have the same conversation. We had this conversation about Mary Barra at GM, about Ginny Romney uh, at IBM, a- about Indra Nui years ago at PepsiCo. Every time we say, okay, she's crashed through that glass ceiling, we finally have made it. And yet those numbers are stubbornly, like barely, barely moving. Last Q4, which was effectively ended uh, 1st of July last year, uh, our our subscriptions were used 12 times a month on average. Um, This year, the quarter that just closed, they were used close to 25 times a month on average. So when you're you're paying us $39 a month and getting 25 workouts from your household, it's close to $1.50 per workout. It's just insane value. They own the majority of the market here in the U.S. with smartphones, when the, uh, with the iPhone. They control the ecosystem, you know, end to end. And they can just decide that we can't launch new updates to our apps at any given moment. You've seen a series of articles and even some lawsuits around their influence and power over developers over the last couple of months. Um, so I think that we're going to have to just make our case as strongly as we can. The dozens of major wildfires burning through the West Coast have already claimed 20 lives and scorched millions of acres of land, 3 million in California alone, which is the most ever from a fire in that state's history. In the middle of a deadly global pandemic, these historic fires have, at least temporarily, displaced hundreds of thousands of people from their homes. 64,000 Californians are under evacuation orders. So are 500,000 people in Oregon. That's more than 12% of the entire state population. In the months to come, we'll learn more about the true economic fallout of this disaster, the cost of prevention and containment, the impact on home values, and the obligations of insurance companies. This year's fires are worse than they've been in past seasons. Cal Fire, California's fire agency, said that six of the top 20 largest fires in state history have happened in 2020. So why are the wildfires especially severe this year? CNBC Digital asked a Stanford climate scientist to explain. So what we're experiencing this year in California and and now tragically in Oregon and Washington as well is really an unprecedented um, wildfire year in terms of the total area that's burned. We have the largest wildfire in history, the, the, the third largest wildfire, the fourth largest wildfire, uh, five of the top 10, uh, six of the top 20, um, just in, in, in California's recorded history uh, over the last century or so. So this is, this is really uh, a major wildfire season. This year we've had many large wildfires from the very unusual lightning siege that occurred in August. And that being said, the vast majority of ignitions in California are are human caused. It's not unusual to have large wildfires in California prior to the autumn season. And in recent years, we have experienced some of California's largest and most devastating wildfires in the fall when these strong winds pick up. Uh, We call them Diablo winds in the Northern California, Santa Ana winds in Southern California. They're a fact of life. What's changing is that because it's getting drier as a result of global warming uh, in California, the risk of wildfire when those uh, strong winds blow uh, has uh, been going up. And that means we're more likely to be facing these multiple fires in multiple locations simultaneously, which, which as we're seeing tragically in the last several weeks and in recent years, this really puts stress on our wildfire management system. What the California fire commanders, for instance, have made very clear during this recent episode is that they just don't have the resources. They have just been insufficient to stop so many wildfires from from getting out of control uh, because they're occurring simultaneously. The increasing frequency of, of extreme wildfire weather conditions means that we're more likely to experience 
multiple events uh, simultaneously that really stress our wildfire response resources, um, you know, past, past the point at which they can uh, prevent fires becoming uh, very large destructive fires. Okay, time for our numbers round. First up is 300 billion, a Republican Senate bill that would have provided $300 billion in new coronavirus aid was blocked by Democrats in procedural votes this week as hopes on Capitol Hill fade for a fresh wave of stimulus funds. Now, the skinny bill, as it's been dubbed, authorized the $300 billion for small businesses, coronavirus testing, and schools, in addition to a $300 bump in weekly unemployment benefits. But Democrats wanted a bigger bill that provided more money. According to the Washington Post, Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi defended her colleagues in the Senate, telling her members, quote, don't be a cheap date. Next is 11. Some bad news for Nikola, aka that electric vehicle company that hasn't made a car yet and has next to no revenue. Just days after auto industry heavyweight General Motors took an 11% stake in the company, a short selling firm released a report accusing Nikola and its founder of fraud. Now, shorting or selling short shares of a company is just a financial bet that the value of the shares will decrease. Short selling firm Hindenburg Research accused Trevor Milton, Nikola's founder and executive chairman, of making false statements about the company's tech in order to grow and make deals. Hindenburg claims it has evidence in the form of phone call recordings and text messages. Nikola dismissed these allegations this morning, and GM made a statement standing behind its partnership. But Nikola's stock sank on the news. And finally, 20. According to Page Six, the Kardashians are looking to sign a big streaming deal with the likes of Netflix, Apple, or Amazon following their split with the E! Network after 20 seasons of Keeping Up with the Kardashians. Now, deals with streaming companies can be super lucrative. For example, two years ago, producer Ryan Murphy signed one with Netflix worth a reported $300 million. That's it for After Hours, but before we go, here's one thing to watch next week. TikTok is supposed to announce a sale to a U.S. company by next Tuesday to avoid a ban by the government, and Microsoft and Oracle are the interested buyers. But with the deadline quickly approaching, Reuters reported today that Chinese leaders in Beijing would rather TikTok shut down in the U.S. entirely than see a forced sale go through. Now, remember, TikTok is owned by Chinese tech firm ByteDance, so there's a lot going on here, and President Trump isn't budging. I'm not extending deadlines, no. It's September 15th. Don't miss a single development in this fast-moving saga. Check out CNBC.com and download the CNBC app. We'll be back here next week in our home office on Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday with new editions of After Hours, so be sure to catch us then.